everybody, welcome back to History Student Reacts. Today we'll be watching World War I Christmas Truce, Silent Night, Part 1, by Extra History. You might be thinking, wow, Ethan, we had a video yesterday, two days in a row, huh? Well, that's not all. You will be getting another reaction tomorrow. In fact, that reaction will be the second part of this Extra History series on the Christmas Truce. I'm sort of doing this three-part series for Christmas. I didn't intend for them all to be extra history videos, but that's just sort of how it worked out. Uh, so I hope you guys are having a great holiday, whether you celebrate Christmas or not. When I uploaded this yesterday, will have been Christmas, so I hope you guys had a fantastic day. So in regards to the Christmas truce, obviously I know what it is, but I'm excited to learn some more details about it that Maybe I didn't know, particularly if it had any ramifications for the war as a whole. I'm pretty curious about that. Anyway, if you guys end up enjoying this video, I would appreciate it if you would check out the Patreon or channel memberships through which you can get exclusive reaction content. Anyway, with all of that out of the way, let's jump right into this reaction. Christmas Eve, 1914. Mm. The war was supposed to be over by now. Yep, a pretty quick intro, but that is a good way to start. As I'm sure a lot of you know, the build-up to World War I was characterized by a lot of nationalistic enthusiasm, a lot of militarism. You know, these big European empires were sort of butting heads with each other, and they wanted to show their power and prove that they could win a decisive and quick war against their enemies. Of course, it became very quickly clear that the war would not end as quickly as everyone expected, and a lot of that enthusiasm fell away. And that's kind of where we are at this point. This little holiday special is brought to you by World of Tanks. Use the invite code ARMISTICE if you're a new player who wants to check out the game. The Christmas Truce is one of the most poignant events of the First World War, a mm. time when men rose up above the madness of the conflict and, for just a moment, saw each other as fellow humans. Yeah, it's a really fascinating moment, and I do think it raises a lot of questions, of course. You know, since World War I has happened, it obviously, and for good reason, hasn't been remembered fondly. And there's this idea, and I think it's basically a fair idea, that this was a war fought by these big colonial powers, these big empires, and the common man had to suffer for it. And I think one of the reasons why the Christmas truce is remembered and mythologized so much is that it's kind of a look in to the life of the regular soldier and kind of, you know, this idea that, well, maybe we don't have to fight each other. You know, I might be British and you might be German, but do we have to kill each other? Or could we be friends, you know? Could we come together? It's sort of an interesting thing to think about. I mentioned recently in one of our Story of Civilis reactions, there's this popular quote, this popular phrase that goes something along the lines of, you know, what if they held a war and no one showed up to fight? This is kind of along those lines. It makes you think, you know, what would have happened if something like the Christmas truce had been extended? if men for a longer period of time had just refused to fight each other. Of course, that isn't what happened. Uh, it certainly wasn't like that. But it does raise some of these questions and some of these thoughts. And I think that's one of the reasons why it's such a fascinating event. This is an event that definitely did happen. Thousands of men laid down arms in the truce, but a century of retellings has also kind of sanded down its rough edges and oversimplified its messy reality. Indeed, mm. this event wasn't just the result of pure human spirit and holiday cheer. It was a host of unique factors that okay. drove these enemies to spontaneously declare peace in no man's land. Interesting. And of course, the part I just talked about, about why it's so well remembered and mythologized, that's one part of it. And oftentimes, certain parts of historical events are remembered <laughs> far more than other aspects. And that's why I used the word mythologized, because this was a true event that absolutely did happen, but true events can be sort of misconstrued. So I'm excited to learn about the reality of what happened during the Christmas truce. And really, it may not have been all that spontaneous. Small ah. armistices were happening every day. 
As frontline troops became accustomed to the rhythms of trench warfare, they learned that looking the other way now and then could bring a shred of safety and calm to their lives. The armies ate meals at the same time, which became a daily ceasefire. Patrols frequently ignored each other, adopting a live-and-let-live live attitude. Hmm. Troops often shouted to each other across the lines. After all, the autumn battles had passed, and both sides were waiting out the winter. In reality, the weather was the primary enemy for both sides. I mean, it reminds me of the American Civil War a little bit. I remember a lot of examples from the Civil War where you have the two armies maybe stationed on either side of a river or stationed near each other close enough that the soldiers <laughs> can literally yell at each other uh, and sometimes take pot shots at each other. So there was this sort of interesting interaction, aside from both sides just shooting at each other, where they would sometimes talk or exchange goods. I believe there were exchanges of goods during the Civil War as well. Um, I might be mistaken. Maybe some of you can correct me on that. But what they're pointing out is correct. Uh, the Christmas truce was unique, but it's not like something like that would never happen or had never happened. The high water table at Flanders meant that the trenches were always filling with water, sometimes collapsing and burying men inside. Soldiers Ugh. leaned against the walls to sleep, trying to keep themselves out of the wet. Food supplies had to be hung up on dugout ceilings, and that winter had been particularly miserable. Yeah, I mean, as they're pointing out, uh, I believe in World War One, you know, there were still far more deaths from disease and environmental causes than there were from actual gunfire, from fighting. Uh, this was true for a lot of wars um, in this era, and of course before World War I. Only in the modern day do we have the medical technology that disease has become less prevalent during warfare. But with the conditions these men were living in, you know, freezing, constantly damp, getting sick, cramped, uh, yeah, really the weather, diseases, their environment was sometimes, particularly in the winter, more of an enemy than their actual opponents uh, across no man's land. Weeks of rain flooded the dugouts. The mud pulled men down like quicksand. Mm. Now, British Field Marshal Sir John French had noticed the hands-off attitude his men were developing towards the enemy, and so he ordered attacks in late December to boost morale. And this resulted in heavy British losses. Ugh. Concerned about possible fraternization over the holiday, he issued orders that no unofficial armistice would be tolerated. Interesting. So some of the commanding officers actually saw this coming and wanted to prevent it. Uh, and I will say, some of this fraternization and, you know, enemy patrols sort of ignoring each other makes sense when we think about how World War I played out. Uh, it was a very static war in many ways, not all theaters. Some theaters of the war moved a lot faster than others, but when we think about the sort of traditional Western Front trench warfare, you know, two trenches, pretty static positions, no man's land in between them. They'd go back and forth, sometimes claiming some territory, maybe moving forward, but not that much movement. So in that sort of environment, I think it does make a lot of sense that you might learn to just sort of ignore the enemy soldiers. You know, what's the point of shooting at each other when you're on patrol? To, what, to kill more people for you to end up dead? It's probably not really worth the risk if you're going to stay in the same trench for months to come or, you know, move like 15 feet forward. Morale was much better over in the German trenches. After all, they were winning. But mm. many men were also experiencing their first holiday away from home. Knowing that this would be difficult, commanders brought Christmas to the trenches, shipping thousands of presents to the field. Each man received a gift from the Kaiser. Cigar <laughs> boxes for NCOs, a pipe with the crown prince on it for the ranks. The British, wow. for their part, received a brass box from Princess Mary filled with cigarettes, tobacco, a Christmas card, and sweets. Very interesting. You know, in these sort of symbolic actions, you can see what sort of symbols are important to a country. Uh, and of course, at this point, um, you know, your monarch, your king, your kaiser is very important to you. Um, a lot of people probably held their royal families of whatever respective country they were from in very high regard. So a present from the Kaiser, um, you know, of course they know it's not personalized and 
Maybe they didn't think it was that important, but it shows you how important the symbol of the Kaiser was. Or in this case, how important the British royal family was. That sort of symbolism. So, that's sort of an interesting little tidbit. And then there were personal packages. Enterprises sprang up on the home front, offering family members a chance to send gift boxes to the troops. British soldiers received plum puddings and thousand-count boxes of cigarettes. German and Austrian troops were bombarded with chocolate and salami and hmm. cognac. Both sides received mm. winter clothing. In truth, though, the gifts were kind of a nuisance. I mean, there was nowhere to put it all. Soldiers didn't have a place to store a thousand extra cigarettes. But that <laughs> Christmas Eve delivered a true gift. The rain stopped, and the trenches drained. Nice. Dry cold froze the mud into a hard surface, almost like a floor. Snow dusted <laughs> the country. I mean, that's how bad it was. That with the ground freezing over, you were so much happier than how you were. Because for the longest time, you've been walking around in these trenches, either walking around in damp mud... And you know, that's not good for you. I mean, think of trench foot. That's pretty horrifying. Or you're literally just walking around in a pool of water. Water up to your ankles. You know, you get no reprieve from walking through soggy ground or just water. And finally the rain has stopped and the ground is frozen over. I mean, oh my god. Imagine how satisfying that must be of a month, more than a month, months of this sort of weather. I mean, jeez. Freeside. That afternoon, the gunfire dwindled, and in some sectors, it stopped entirely. The weather just seemed too nice for it. The <laughs> Germans, stuffed with Christmas chocolate and cheered by the weather, started putting lit Tannenbaum up on their trench parapets. And then, the German line started <laughs> singing. Over on the British parapets, watchmen of the Scots Guard saw lines of lights along the enemy trench. At first, they suspected an attack. But then, they heard an ethereal sound drifting across no man's land. Stille Nacht, Heilige Nacht. The original Austrian version yep. of Silent Night. How about that? And of course, even me, I don't speak any German. Uh, if you're someone like me, you only speaks English, you'll recognize what they're singing. I mean, the tune of the song, also it sounds a lot like Silent Night. Um, though imagine if you're one of those people, one of those Brits looking over the trenches, you spot these lights... And then you first hear the singing. I imagine you'd be very confused at first. Though quickly, you'd probably understand what was happening. Sensing a challenge, Guards Officer Lieutenant Sir Edward Hulse decided that they should drown this out with their own carol. Ah, there we go. For a second there, I was worried that he was going to try and mount an attack. But he went, uh, you know, the high school musical route. <laughs> the Germans are singing Christmas carols. No, we're not going to have that. Boys, start singing some carols of your own. I mean, that's a lot more wholesome than shooting at each other. <laughs> the sides went back and forth, but soon the competition merged into a harmony of Good King Wenceslas and Aww. Old Lang Syne. The men began shouting Christmas greetings across the line, jokingly at first. A few even stepped out to talk. Hulse didn't know it, Whoa. but the same thing was happening up and down the entire British line. Agreements formed. In some sectors, the officers met at the wire and shook hands, agreeing to huh. cease hostilities the next day. Okay, so as we can see, this is still rather spontaneous, but one, as we saw earlier, some of the British officer corps knew this sort of thing was coming, and two, you know, the Brits and the Germans are now making these sort of slapdash agreements that, okay, we'll have a temporary ceasefire, a truce for tomorrow. So I would say this is still pretty spontaneous, but maybe not as spontaneous as it's sometimes portrayed. But, you know, the idea of the Germans singing carols and then <laughs> the Brits start singing their own and then they all join in, you know, that's still spontaneous and just a genuine human moment. You know, so I think really the core of the story still remains in the real events that occurred. In other areas, the ranks took the lead. Germans shouting across no man's land, English, tomorrow if you no shoot, we no shoot. Mm. At times, it was just one brave soul walking into no man's land waving wow. a newspaper. These overtures were extremely dangerous. Though peace was breaking out in certain areas, it didn't happen everywhere. 
One British regiment responded to German caroling with a machine gun blast. Oh. Some unarmed soldiers were gunned down trying to broker this holiday armistice. But in most sec- Yeah, I mean, that's always a shame. And if you're the one guy who walks up to no man's land, that's a pretty frightening thing to do. I mean, you've, you've got balls of steel, I'll put it that way. <laughs> no man's land is a terrifying place to be. Um, I mean, you hear all the horrifying experience of those who served in World War I. You know, pretty terrible. But for you to climb up there, walk across, or get close enough to yell to the Germans, you know, that takes some bravery. Actors, the ceasefire held. This truce mostly happened between German and British units. The French and the Belgians, whose countries were under German occupation, were yeah. less inclined. Yeah, I was wondering why we were only talking about the Brits and the Germans, but that makes a lot of sense. You know, as they said, the French and the Belgians, their country is currently occupied, particularly the Belgians. They've faced a lot of atrocities from the Germans. And then, you know, if we look at France and Germany... They have had a lot of nationalistic beef over, well, actually a really long time period. But, you know, the German, modern German Empire was formed in the 1870s, and as soon as it was formed, it was an immediate threat to France's position. So, you know, they don't really get along. Um, the French and the Germans don't like each other. They've had a lot of wars between each other for a long time. So it makes sense that there wouldn't be that, uh, you know, holiday spirit that we're seeing between the British and the German soldiers. There were agreements to bury the dead and cease hostilities, but not as much fraternization. Yet a Bavarian unit held fire during a French mass, and both hmm. sides halted fighting long enough for a guest, a soloist from the Paris Opera, to make a performance. Wow. British Indian troops, who were a bit unfamiliar with this whole Christmas deal, saw hmm. the lit German trees and thought of their own holiday of Diwali. They mm. held fire, but also held position, until some Germans tempted them out of the trenches <laughs> with cigars and cigarettes. Soon the men were smoking together on the parapet. Wow. That Christmas night, the troop. So how about that? I mean, we talk about the British and the German soldiers coming together over this shared tradition of Christmas, but, you know, the British Indian soldiers, most of them won't celebrate Christmas, but just that spirit of holiday cheer, you know, everyone coming together, that can still bring these two sides together. And even the French and German soldiers... You know, even though there was probably no love lost, <laughs> they weren't really fond of each other. It seems like there was some respect uh, at this time of year, allowing them to bury bodies or <laughs> listen to opera performances. So, you know, it seems like there was a bit of a spectrum between, you know, the most friendly, the most fraternization, where they literally got together and hung out, and the least when they shot at each other. And there was a lot in the middle. Troops slept in sublime quiet. Christmas Day dawned, bright and cold, the sky clear for the first time in weeks. Wow. To their shock, British troops looked across no man's land to see the Germans walking around on their parapets. Such a thing was suicidal in daylight, and that gesture of trust, more than anything, lured mm. a few British out. I mean, that's what it is, it's trust. But also, you can imagine how tempting that would be. We've talked about how bad the conditions were down in the trenches to get the opportunity to climb up and just walk about. That's a luxury. <laughs> so that's certainly trust from the Germans to the British, but also a pretty tempting prospect. You just want to normally walk about and, you know, talk with your fellow soldiers, talk with your friends, have a good time at Christmas. It was heaven to at last stand up straight and walk on solid earth. Some had ventured into yeah. no man's land on Christmas Eve, but in daylight, it was impossible to ignore the bodies lying between the trenches. The mm. two sides buried their dead in common graves, grieving side by side wow. in joint services, listening to the faraway sounds of battle from other sectors. And, you know, once again, not to make it too philosophical, because we were talking about the actual events that happened. I don't want to, like, moralize too much, but... It does give you a look at how, regardless of the wider causes of the war, or the nationalism on both sides, or even the nationalistic hatred from one side to the other, these soldiers, they're just people. They're just people trying to live their lives, trying to survive, defend their families, you know, live a good life. 
And we can see that here. They're burying their bodies in common graves, mourning together. Even if there is this nationalism and this dislike because of that nationalism, on a really personal level, it doesn't go back and forth. It's not a hatred from one man to another. They can come together just as human beings. And, you know, that's why this is such a special moment. And that shared experience broke down the wall. Soldiers milled about together in no man's land, swapping over huh. abundant gifts from home. Wow. British beef for uniform buttons, chocolate cake for barrels of beer. They exchanged hats. One German barber gave haircuts. The men <laughs> chatted. After all, they shared so much in common. They lived in the same fields under the same rain, and they yeah. were equally sick of war. Besides, they were curious. What was life like on the other side? Who were these enemies? One British officer was perplexed to learn that his new German friend believed the armies of the Kaiser fought for freedom. Hmm. That was impossible, the officer responded. We're fighting for freedom. And would you look at that? <laughs> so once again, we have the broader conflict, and in this specific case, the propaganda fed to the soldiers and fed to the officers by their governments, and with these two people talking to each other, a lot of that is being dispersed, <laughs> you know? Because when you're getting your information from... I mean, look, you're a soldier on the front. You don't have a lot of sources of information. You are hearing what your government is telling you and whatever can be sort of passed around amongst the soldiers, whatever comes in from home. And so to actually talk to the other side, <laughs> you're probably going to learn a lot about what's actually going on and what the other side thinks. Amid this, Lieutenant Hulse found himself talking to Lieutenant Thomas of the 15th Westphalians, who had hmm. something to pass on. A Victoria Cross and a packet of letters. Wow. An English officer had died in the German trench during the last attack. Perhaps he could give these to the man's family? Touched, Hulse removed his own silk scarf, a gift from home, and presented it in thanks. Hmm. Thomas, embarrassed that he had nothing to give in return, sent a soldier to fetch the fur gloves that his family had sent. Up and down the line, men started bringing out footballs. Kickabouts broke yeah. out with men. I mean, this is one of the most famous scenes from the Christmas truce. This is what is often talked about. Both sides playing soccer slash football. I'm trying to appease the Americans and the Europeans here. Um, <laughs> both sides playing football with each other. You know, this is one of the uh, most popular surviving images of this event from both sides chasing the ball among shell holes and sliding on the frozen ground. In one sector, a group of Highlanders challenged a Saxon regiment, who <laughs> burst out laughing whenever a kilt flew up during play. Okay, but not all come of this on. activity was goodwill. On both sides, a few used the gatherings to reconnoiter enemy trenches, and both sides used the time to repair dugouts. Yeah, and I mean, look, this is just how life is. If there is a nice event going on or people generally have goodwill... There's always a few who are trying to do something for their own gain, doing something mischievous. Um, that's just how it is, and that's just something you have to accept. It's not surprising. Um, it's a little unfortunate, but I think overall, <laughs> this is a good moment where both sides have goodwill for each other. So the inevitable people who are going to be spying on the other side, it's unfortunate, but it just is what it is. Of course, for some, this fraternization appeared false. One British soldier flashed his squad mate a hidden dagger, while another refused to smoke German cigarettes, fearing that they might be poisoned. <laughs> when one squad of Bavarians discussed whether to meet the British, their corporal snapped at them. Such a thing should not happen in wartime. Have you no German sense of honor left at all? Mm. They weren't surprised. The night. And there's that sense of nationalism, of course. Uh, the soldiers are saying, you know what? Why don't we go and meet the Brits, right? We can just, you know, see them, have a Christmas celebration. And their corporal's saying, well, where's your sense of honor? Well, you know, uh, where's your patriotism is basically what he's saying. So, you know. Before, the same soldier had refused to join the unit's Christmas service. Corporal Hitler was odd like that. Oh, wow. But his disapproval wow. reflected the general. I did not expect that. <laughs> Well, that makes a lot of sense. View. This was exactly the situation that Field Marshal French had feared. Commanders mm -hmm. dispatched senior officers to threaten disciplinary action and insist that the men restart the war. 
In some sectors, the armistice came to an orderly close. Officers from both sides saluted and fired revolvers into the air, signaling that, all right, the war was back on. In a few places, troops resisted until nearly to New Year's Eve. Wow. Now that's pretty remarkable. And this is one of the things I was curious about. Did the Christmas truce have any wider effects on the war? And I say that because while I think this is a good event, um, you can understand why the higher-ups wouldn't want this to happen. Because it's probably harder <laughs> to get back in the trenches and shoot at each other after you've just come together to play a game of football or, you know, trade beer for chocolate cake, <laughs> right? Um, so I was curious if there were any actual effects. Did some units hold out and refuse to fight? Was there more hesitancy to fight each other? Because, of course, this is 1914. Uh, the war would continue for, <laughs> you know, several more years, so there would be a lot more fighting down the line, um, which is, you know, one of the interesting things about this truce. Like I said, there are other examples of fraternization during warfare or people passing things back and forth, but this sort of, like, large-scale truce in the middle of a war, I think, is pretty rare. Um, so that's one of the reasons why it's interesting. But the generals would not have it. German command dispatched snipers to break the ceasefire. French ordered an artillery barrage, letting the machinery of war roll over the human connections of the frontline troops. Mm. Nothing like this Christmas truce would happen again. Yeah. The generals wouldn't allow it. On Christmas Eve 1915, British officers ordered a 24-hour artillery barrage. Men who tried to form a truce were court-martialed. Interesting. Okay, so this sort of answers one of my questions, which is they some men did try to do this again. Because, of course, the Christmas truce only happened one time, at least on a large scale. So I was wondering, did it happen again? Did people try to do it again? Because, you know, I've only heard of this one instance, and it didn't because the higher-ups did not allow it to happen. Very interesting. Machine guns drowned out German carols, but the generals needn't have bothered. The spirit of that truce was unique to 1914. Ah, and this as well. This is another factor. Uh, you know, I mentioned how the enthusiasm going into the war quickly died away, and even at this point, a lot of the men were pretty miserable. But that's nothing compared to how they would feel in 1915, 1916, 1917, uh, or throughout most of 1918, right? Um... So I imagine some of that goodwill was certainly lost as the war dragged on. A symptom of a young war. By Christmas 1915, those troops had experienced chlorine gas and creeping yeah. bombardments. Zeppelins were bombing London. The Battle of Verdun would end just before the holiday, leaving 750,000 casualties. Indeed, many of the men who celebrated in no man's land that day would never see another Christmas. Yeah. Yeah, certainly. And, I mean, you can see how the resentment grew um, between these countries. I mean, it's hard to talk about the men in particular, but between these countries in the post-war negotiations, Britain and France, France in particular, really wanted to kick Germany in the rear, you know? They wanted to blame the whole thing on Germany, impose massive reparations, take territory, strip them of their army, and, I mean, that's what they did. So you can see that anger and those nationalistic sentiments continued to grow. Uh, I think particularly amongst the higher-ups and the governments, but probably amongst the men themselves. Though, I think by the end of the war, the men more just wanted to go home and be done with the whole thing. One of those unlucky ones was Lieutenant Sir Edward Hulse, who had uh. sung carols and given a German officer his silk scarf. He died three months later while trying to save a wounded comrade. He was 25. Mm. And yet, Hulse is not remembered today for his military achievements, or even the book of letters that his friends published after his death. He and so many others are remembered for a victory entirely their own, when a group of brave men ventured into the line of fire, trusting their enemies not to shoot, and believing that humanity was better than the bonfire it had built for itself. Happy holidays, everybody. I mean, hey, that's not a bad thing to be remembered for. <laughs> um, you know, you're remembered for one of the few good, wholesome moments of humanity 
during an otherwise pretty terrible conflict, uh, a horrifying conflict. So I'd say that's a pretty good legacy to leave. Um, yeah, I really enjoyed this. Uh, I feel like I learned a lot, a lot about the context of the Christmas truce. Uh, I'm curious what part two is going to be about. Remember, part two will be uploaded tomorrow. Uh, I suspect it might be about how the Christmas truce was received, the legacy, uh, maybe its wider impact. I'm not quite sure. Uh, but yeah, I'm excited to get into part two. Uh, I hope you guys enjoyed this video. If you did, please leave a like, subscribe, check out the Patreon and channel memberships. Uh, I hope you guys are having a great holiday season. Uh, spending it with your family or people you care about, eating some good food, just having a good time. Anyway, I hope you guys are having a great day today, and I will see you all again next time. Goodbye.